Let me take you back in time. Let's go to 1936, and let's go to Berlin. 1936 Berlin was the site of the Olympic Games, but as you could also imagine, it was the site of quite a historical political moment of the world. On August 4th, two gentlemen were going to be competing head against head for the first time ever, and that was in the long jump competition. Lutz Long, the German athlete, was the European uh, record holder for the long jump, and Jesse Owens, the American athlete, was the world record hold holder for the long jump. On the morning of that day, it was qualifications. Lutz Long qualifies seamlessly, and the world record holder fails his first two attempts. He has one more attempt to go. If he does not manage that, he's out. Now, for a world record holder, that is quite a traumatic moment. And everyone could, could witness that, everyone who was at that stadium. Because you could see Jesse Owens sitting down on the track with his head in his hands, not knowing what to do. But then something really unexpected happened. Lutz Long, the German athlete, walked up to Jesse and whispered something into his ear in front of everyone's eyes. Now, some minutes later, Jesse takes on the track he qualifies for the, uh, for the final round. In the afternoon, these two gentlemen compete, and they break the world record for five consecutive times, and the competition ends with Jesse Owens winning the gold medal. Lutz Long takes home silver, but what is most importantly was that he was the first one to congratulate Jesse on this outstanding achievement. Now, some years later, we discover what Lutz Long actually whispered to, to Jesse. He was coaching him. He was telling him, you are the world record holder. You're the champion. As a champion, you want to give it your best shot each and every time. But right now, you only have to qualify. So focus on this, and then in the afternoon, we'll see what happens. Now, these two gentlemen remained friends for many years to come. In one of his last, last letters that Lutz Long sent to Jesse Owens, he wrote these marvelous words. This simple story portray some of the human values that the Olympic movement represents, stories of friendship and stories of excellence. Even though times have changed, and even though we are almost 80 years ahead, the story is still the same. The values are still the same. As you can see in the words of the president of the International Olympic Committee, Thomas Bach, during his opening speech of the Sochi Olympic Games last year. Friendship, excellence. Wonderful, wonderful values that the Olympic movement represents. My name is Monir Zak. Good morning, buenos dias. I'm working at the Olympic Committee in the US. I'm in charge of uh, technology over there. And I will be spending the next minutes talking to you about wearable technology and how wearable technology is changing the, wor the world of the Olympic sports and all sports in general. All of you guys who are on the social feeds, please use all of the hashtags that you see up there. I'm sure Arno will appreciate that a lot. Now, many people have asked me yesterday and today and in the past, where are you from? And I really have a hard time explaining this, so I'll share with you the long story. I was born in Lebanon. That is where I was raised in, in the mid-70s. Then I lived for quite a big chunk of my life in Cyprus. I moved to Europe to pursue my uh, postgraduate career. I studied biomedical engineering both in England and in Italy. I got my PhD and I ended up spending 15 years in Italy, much longer than what I expected. It was too beautiful to leave. And talking about beauty, that is where I met my beautiful wife, who was from Spain, hence a bit of Spanish from here. And to make it more complicated, we decided to move to the US. And we moved here with, to the US with our seven-year-old kid, who's now nine. And last Saturday, we celebrated the four, one year old of my little baby, Maya. So it, when you ask me, where are you from? I say, I don't know, really. But I like to think of myself as a person from the Mediterranean. There's something about the Mediterranean that just describes very, very well all of those countries over there. I myself enjoy sports. I'm not an athlete, as you could tell. I didn't grow as tall as, as I wanted to be. Um, I'm, I'm passionate about technology, I'm passionate about wearable technology, I'm passionate about outdoors, and I'm passionate about photography. So, let's move forward. Now, the world of 
of Olympic sports is quite a competitive world, right? It's, uh, it's so competitive that even when you have a photo finish of a competition, it's very hard to tell who won. It's very hard to tell who walked away with the gold medal. It's at such a competition that the difference between a gold medal and no medal at all is quicker than any one of you here can blink your eyes. These are the margins that we have to work with. These are the margins that make the difference between who gets most glory at the Olympic Games. Within the Olympic world, we always talk about the 1%, the 1% difference, the 1% margin that will get us the results that we're looking for. Now, these are the, the dreams of each and every Olympian. We all know that. You know, they're all working towards this. And we all know that Olympic athletes are people just like you and I. You know, people have got personal problems, they have got financial problems, they have got um, relationships, they sleep, they train, they eat. What sets them apart is that they have organized their lives so that they optimize those elements that you see up there. So that they can produce the best performance possible when the time comes. And talking about performance, let's, let's focus a little bit about how do we evaluate performance. Now, some years back, the only way in which we could evaluate and measure the performance of an athlete was to bring that athlete into a standardized environment, an environment that was controlled by lots of scientific brains and lots of scientific power, an environment where an athlete would not feel, though, as if they are performing their natural sport. It's not their natural field of play but it was the only way in which we could measure performance, right? So the process was, let's collect the data, let's develop the algorithms, let's analyze the data, let's present the results to the coaches, and then hopefully the coaches will understand what we're talking about, and then they'll come back to us with more. Now, there, there are two flaws with this system. First is that the information was never available real time. It was always after the fact. And second, most importantly of all, was that even though the science was highly accurate, even though the engineering was highly accurate, the data was not very relevant, was it? We talked about Messi, we talked about Iniesta. If we get these guys here and we tell them, can you sprint from that, from that point of the stage to that point of the stage, they will sprint, but would it be the same sprint that they would do out on the football field or on the soccer field? Probably not. Now, as time moves forward, thanks to the evolution of technology, the work that is done on measuring performance moves slowly, slowly, from a standardized environment or a lab or whatever we want to call it, onto the field. But most importantly, it frees the athlete from having to simulate an action within a standardized environment like this one. And it puts them in a position where they can perform their natural sport and their natural field of play. Now, somewhere around the 2002 mark, some things happened that brought us to where we are today. And I'll share these with you. The first thing that happened was that there were some small sensors that were becoming to become available on the market. Companies out of Northern Europe were putting these out for this research market and for the scientific market. They were not wireless, really, but they were small, they were lightweight, so you could practically put them on the body and be able to bring your measurements outside onto the field rather than limit them to internally. They were quite cumbersome, as you can see from these photographs. I took these photographs in Rome in 2002, 2003, was when I was doing my PhD. This was one of the projects I was working on. And as you could, as you could see, the experimental setup was still lengthy, right? Um, th those, those blue boxes, those are the boxes that the athletes had to wear on their bodies. We just scotch taped them and whatnot, but still, we were outside. You could see the green grass, we were outside in the sunshine. We were not limited to the uh, windowless labs. Then another thing happened. A very good friend of mine, Pietro, had to become really, really fit and had to practice each and every day to do this. I tried, I promise. I tried running, but I, was not, I just did not go tall enough. 
So this was one of the pioneering moments in what we call today wearable technology. Thanks to these advances, thanks to the fact that we don't have to worry about batteries anymore, we don't have to worry about wireless transmission anymore, we don't have to worry about data storage anymore, we take those things for granted, right? I mean, we all have smartphones in our pockets, come on. Thanks to this, today we talk about wearable technology. We talk about a new technology, we talk about a new world, we talk about new possibilities that 10 years ago were seemed science fiction and even five years ago did not seem to be as close as they are today. Now, is this not working? Okay. Now today, we are able to package into one small earphone technologies that are just amazing. Now we talk about activity technologies, physiological technologies, GPS technology, battery, storage, earphones. I mean, come, this, it's, it's marvelous. It's wonderful, and we don't have to worry about the fact that we cannot get a data point anymore. We can get everything, and we will get everything. Now, the wearable technology market it's, it's, it's quite a serious market, right? I mean, and, and any of you guys who are working in this industry, you know this. Only in the US, it's going to be more than a $12 billion market in 2018. This, this is serious, serious stuff. It's not here to fade out, it's here to stay. So how does this translate into sports, right? How, how does this affect sports? How does this affect the small niche that is Olympic sports? Now, any one of you who does some kind of browsing will be aware of the fact that there are many products out there. Almost on a weekly basis, we have a new wearable technology product coming out. And I get the question, being uh, the person that I am and working in the position that I am working, how do you choose? Do you go with brand A or do you go with brand B or do you go with brand C? Now, I have to explain to you a couple of things about the US Olympic Committee. One, it's a non-government um, organization. It does not receive any funding from the government. It's only sponsor-driven. Two, we don't have any internal resources to do internal research and development on technology. So what we find ourselves doing all of the time is on one hand, helping our coaches ask the right questions, and on the other hand, partnering with key individuals and with key uh, organizations on the market to get the job done. We don't necessarily work with wearable technology companies that you would find uh, in the consumer market. Those tend to be very suitable for analyzing uh, or for helping our athletes understand their lifestyle, but we tend to be inspired by other markets. Those could span anything from space and farming to medical and, and military, and figure out how can we learn lessons that have already been learned in other industries rather than reinventing the wheel each and every time. Now, of course, we cannot have a conference without having Einstein twice in two hours. Um, I cannot stress enough how important this message is, and this is what I tell all of my team. Let's not begin working on anything until we figure out what the real problem is. Much like what Antonio was saying, let's go out and talk to our, to our customers. Let's figure out what they want. Let's figure out what their lifestyle is. How much time do they have with their athletes if we're talking about the coaches? Right? Do they know how to use a smartphone? Do they have a smartphone? Do they have kids? And so on and so on and so on. Now our job as technologists is really to put the coaches in the driving seat, right? You and I, when we're driving, we know when we need to put gas, we know when we need to slow down. But we're not car experts. We don't have to be car experts because we have got a very simple user interface, a very simple dashboard that we can look at and we can, we can make very wise decisions. Coaches need to be in this exact same position. They need to know when to slow down with their athletes and they need to know when they can push them. It's the same, same concept. So I'll share with you a bit of examples of what we are doing with Team USA. I will not reveal much, you, you can appreciate that. But I'll tell you how, in some cases, we are finding that 1% edge. And I'll, I'll share with you some examples, some snapshots from different sports. Our diving team is using wearable technology, and our coaches are making informed decisions that they were not able to make as they were preparing for the London Olympic Games. 
decisions that are, uh, are based on data that is being calculated with artificial intelligence algorithms in the background, but presented to them in a very, very, very easy manner, much like the colors that you see on the top left of the screen. You take our gymnastics team, imagine the possibilities there. Imagine the possibilities of having very, very small lightweight sensors on the gymnast's body that can analyze all of the routine and present the coaches with the information that answers some of their questions in a very easy fashion. You talk about boxing. Boxing agility, power, precision, and stamina are of great importance. So how about if we can determine those almost in real time so that when we have that one minute break, we could help our athletes understand the effect that the previous round had on their bodies so that they can optimize their plan for the upcoming rounds. Talk about team pursuit and track cycling. Understanding the contribution of each and every cyclist of the whole pack, given that these three have to cross the finish line and only when the third one crosses the finish line the, the time stops, is of crucial importance because whenever someone, especially the leader, is not giving out the 100% that they're expected to, they need to be aware of that and they need to change. Otherwise, they're just losing time. I won't even go into Paralympics. This, this is fascinating to me because Paralympics, unlike the Olympics, there's always an equipment involved, there's always a machine involved, there's always technology involved. And without that equipment, without that technology, the sport cannot happen, it cannot take place. The possibilities there are infinite, and it's amazing. Now we talk about wearable technology today, but as we move forward, there are some very interesting things happening on the market. So on one hand, we are beginning to see robotic arms that could be controlled by muscle activities of the same limbs, of the normally functioning limb. So imagine the possibilities there for, for our uh, Paralympians, especially when they need to perform symmetric tasks. We're beginning to see electronic tattoos on the market, tattoos that have got sensors and data transmission uh, capabilities within them that are able to measure, for example, heart rate, they're able to measure hydration levels, they're able to measure glucose levels, able to measure lactate levels. We are beginning to see contact lenses with electronics embedded within them so that, they, uh, so that you can analyze the, the fluids that run in the ice stream, and those are very, very good indicators to begin extracting some biomarkers from them. A very recent article that I was reading in Time talked about never offline, right, or always online. This is the direction that we're heading there, and you know what? If this, seemed too, if this seems too far-fetched today, I'd say let's think five years back, and who would have thought that we would be today where we are today with wearable technology? Now the exciting thing is that once you begin layering on top of it what is called today the Internet of Things or the connected world or the connected environments, then you begin envisioning athletes and coaches being able to work in a much more intelligent way. And today's athlete is definitely more intelligent than yesterday's athlete. For the mere fact that today's athlete is able to make more informed decisions because she understands more how her body behaves and how her body functions, whether that is in response to training or whether that is in response to travel or whether that is in response to a lifestyle that she's leading. Much like Lutz Long changed Jesse Owens' life, I believe that sport is a great vehicle. I believe that sport can truly change the world. Thank you very much.